everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday sew along. We'll give everybody a minute or two to get on and join us. Um, we are doing block number 30 today, and we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. Um, before we do that, I do want to mention that I did put a new round of classes on our website, and I've also shared it on Facebook and Instagram. If you haven't seen it, you might look it up. The project right behind me, the um, snow crystal, will be one of the classes. And I don't remember the date, so you'll um, need to look it up on either Facebook, Instagram, or our website. And um, the website, you can purchase the class on the website. And all of the classes are available uh, in person, in limited seating, and Zoom is uh, indefinite because um, as many people as want to sign up can attend via Zoom. So we run them at the same time. It works very well, and the people who have done classes with us um, during the time that we're doing Zoom and in person, um, everybody says it works just fine for them. So that is a consideration. So that's one class. Um, the other two classes that um, I have to show you tonight are the Feathered Star, which is on the left, and the Morning Star, which is on the right. Feathered Star is old school. We're going to do a little bit of Y seams um, and uh, precision sewing. Um, the Morning Star is a trim down tool, the Wedge Star from Studio 180 Design that we use for that one. And then I also have a beginner-friendly class that we're going to offer. So be looking for the sample of that. We'll have that up before too much longer. So I will tell you this week, I got to exercise my superpower. So I told uh, our daughter one time that my superpower was seam ripping. So um, that was kind of a mistake because anytime she needs something ripped out, she hands it to me and says, here, try this. So um, the reason I ended up using my superpower this week is um, you have to be really organized in what fabrics uh, you're using and where they belong in the block. So tonight's block uses the Tucker trimmer and um, the corner pop tool, but it also uses a technique called, I've lost my technique sheet, called shaded nine patch. Now, if you've done the shaded four patch before, this is um, a step or two farther. So you have to be attention to details just basically in where you place your pieces. And there's a little uh, strip piecing involved. I'm gonna show you um, what I did to um, make it a little easier to figure out what I needed to be stitching and where it needed to be placed. So this is our block. The shaded nine patch is this piece right here where it has the three triangles and the four squares. The other side is a half square. And actually that's where the pop of colors going in that center part. Because when I got the shaded nine patch done, I had this pieced section and then a whole half triangle of the uh, red or uh, the white. So that's what we're doing for today. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that. I, I told Tony as I was piecing, this is not something you necessarily want to do or try to do while you're at a retreat because um, after you get everything organized, you would be fine. But at first, when you're trying to figure out which fabric needs to be uh, placed in your strip sets that you're going to start with, it takes a little bit of more concentration. I will say um, I discovered, wrong, hang on, um, I discovered that when I put the pale blue here, it is too pale for my liking. So I did substitute that on the ones I'm going to be showing you tonight, and I'll show you how that fits together. But in my shaded nine patch, I have um, a red corner, a navy center triangle, two light blue triangles, and two background squares. So that's how I arranged my pieces. So you're going to be making some strip sets in order to make the shaded nine patch. So I have two strip sets. This was my strip set number one. Oh, and by the way, if you don't own the Shaded Nine Patch 
technique sheet. We do have them available here at the shop. Um, and you'll want to probably take the time to watch the shaded nine patch um, video just to kind of give you um, another uh, bit of information. But you're going to be making two strip sets, and I'll show you where they end up in the block. So strip set number one is this one. It's got a red, that's what goes in the corner of your block. It's got background, that's what, what's going here. And then it's got the light blue, and there's the light blue that I've substituted. So mine is too pale in the block, but what I'm using to demonstrate with, I think you'll be able to see it a lot easier. So that's strip set number one. Strip set number two is the background, the navy, and another background. In the technique sheet, it's very specific as to what sizes these strips need to be. And if you'll notice, I have labeled them. I've labeled them with the number, and I've labeled them with the fabric. And it would probably be a good idea when you're cutting your fabric to label them with the size because the, my center square is a um, two and three fourth inch strip. My number two position is a two and a half inch strip. My number three uh, fabric is a four and a quarter inch strip. So there's very specific numbers of uh, sizes of strips that you're going to need to keep track of. So that's why I went ahead and numbered them this way. For my second one, I've got um, two background strips. And that's what ends up being these two remaining squares here. And then the center is what ends up being the center triangle. So once you get your two strip sets done, you want to keep track of which is which. I know this one's my number one strip set because it's got my red on it. Because the segments you cut from these two strip sets are different. And for that reason, you actually have to have a strip set of your first uh, combination, whatever goes in the corner, it needs to be twice as long as the strip set you need for the other one. So um, this will make more sense when you read over your technique sheet and kind of follow along with uh, what I'm going to be doing. So on my first strip set, I need to cut these strips the size of this um, outer number one piece. And in, in this case, and if you forget, you can always measure it. This one's two and three fourth inches. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start from this end, and I've actually got some of my selvage here. So I'm going to go past the two and three fourth inch mark on that selvage, and I'm lining up a horizontal line on the seam so I know that I'm straight. And then when I get that cut, I will turn around and true that up to two and three fourths because that's the size segment I need. I'm gonna cut there. And you're going to work your way across cutting those two and three fourth inch segments. So every time you cut one of these trios um, from the, your first strip set, it takes two of them to make um, a unit, a shaded nine patch unit, and that's actually gonna end up being two of your segments for your shaded nine patch. I'm trying to move this over here so you can see that I have two different segments, and we'll be talking about that. So I've got a couple of segments of my first strip set. Now I need a segment of my second strip set, and I even wrote myself a note on the back. I don't know if you can see it. Um, with a friction pin, I wrote two and a half inches just to remind myself that I need to cut strips or segments that are two and a half inches on this strip set. And I'm going to go past the two and a half inch mark, line up on the seams, because the edge here is not straight. And that way I can make sure I line that up and straighten this up. So I would highly suggest marking your strips when you decide what colors you're going to be working with so that you can keep track of which ones you need to have the wider strips, what arrangements they need to be in the strip set, and then I would just hang on to that till you get your block made. 
So I've got a couple of pieces here um, I've already pinned together because I already had cut um, a segment of my second strip set and two segments of the first strip set. So I'm just going to pin those together. That's what I need to make <clears throat> one set. I'm going to put the like colors because this is what I would end up with from these three pieces and the rectangle that goes with it. So after you get to this point, it's very much like the shaded four patch technique. And I'll, I'll be showing you kind of how we did that. So I'm going to go to the sewing area. So don't uh, hesitate to ask questions, but this may be one of the blocks that you end up watching a couple of times just to get the process uh, down for what you actually need to put together. So I'm going to use uh, my strip sets and I need to put together a trio of segments. And it's going to look like this. So when you get that done, um, that's going to give you what you need to pair up with the rectangle of fabric that will be that other half of your shaded nine patch. All right, so what I have discovered in the piecing you're going to be happier if you put whatever your center square color is on top and sew through that, uh, sew with that going through first. So um, I didn't really probably um, emphasize you. Do you hear me now? Okay, we got the batteries changed. It said I had enough power because I checked it before I started, but it was wrong. That means that this one may uh, cut out on me too. If it, if it uh, loses again, just let me know and I'll replace the batteries. It told me I had enough juice, but it was wrong. Okay, so when you get um, your three segments stitched together, you're gonna have, I like to call this a wonky nine patch. And I'll pull out so you can see that. So you've got whatever triangle is in the center of your block should be in the center of your wonky nine patch. And whatever 
square you're going to have on the outer corner of your shaded nine patch should be on the outer corner of this nine patch. These two lighter blues are also going to be triangles. Okay, so what we're going to do is take this to the ironing surface so we can talk about what you do to press these um, and how you want to continue. So I've got my wonky nine patches here and I have two of them and I need two to make my four corners of my block. I'm going to move this out of the way so I have my um, pressing mat. Now on this, I want to be able to press this away from the corner um, on this end and toward the corner on this end. And so if you look at your, um, it's right here, where the um, seams did not meet and nest, you're going to actually cut a little slit right in the seam. And I'll show you. If you go a thread or two past the seam, it's not a problem because that's going to end up in the seam allowance of your shaded nine patch. I'm going to turn it over so maybe you can see what I'm doing. I'm just kind of between those two seams that don't nest, I'm going to cut a little slit. All right, and you're going to do that with all of your shaded nine patch wonky nine patches. So there's my two seams that don't match, they didn't nest, this one did. So that's not the one I'm cutting, I'm cutting in between the two that don't nest. Once you get that done, you're ready to press. And what I'm going to do is kind of give this a glance. I'm going to press toward the um, pale blue and away from the red on this. So whatever is the square, you're going to press away whatever is the rectangle you're going to press toward. All right, so I'm just going to give it a quick little press from the back, which I don't normally do, but I want to make sure that the seams go the direction they need to go in order for them to lay down for the next step. And I'll show you what I mean. Once I get them started in the right direction, then I'll flip it over and set my iron down and let the iron complete that seam. So, you know, when you have to take something out, because it happens, um, I did find that I struggled a little bit with putting my seams together just because it distorts your fabric if, if you're not careful. Um, and even if you are careful, when you end up having to take it out three times like I did, it does happen to me, believe it or not, um, then it made it a little bit uh, ragged on the edge. But from my pieces that you see in my sample, you really can't tell that. It's just hard to see that pale blue. So I'm just going to give this a quick little press with the uh, acorn pressing pin. Notice I hit all of the seams. Now, that's because I did not use the acorn pressing pin when I pressed my uh, strip sets. You certainly could, and that would save a little bit of time. But I did not uh, do that, so I'm doing it now. I'm going to give this, and I'm feeling of it to make sure the seams are all laying the way I want them to lay. Because even when you aim the seams the right direction, sometimes they just don't play nice. So I've got all of my seams headed the right direction and now I've got my wonky nine patches pressed and if you look at the back you can see that the seams uh, flip here so that I can press toward my uh, big rectangle of pale blue and away from my square of red. So now what I'm going to do is I need to draw a double line in between my two squares, my two corner squares. If you remember um, when we have done shaded nine patch in the past, it would look more like this and you draw between your squares. You're doing the same thing with this, but you have a couple of things to look for. 
I don't know if you can see my line here. I'm looking for that intersection. And um, I said that wrong. Nope, this intersection and this intersection. And I considered putting dark thread in there so you could actually see it. But I have four intersections that I'm looking at. And what I'm going to be doing is drawing a line across in between my two corner squares and I want to hit that intersection. And I also want to line up on a 45 degree line. So I've got my 45 degree line on my ruler lined up on a seam and I've got my ruler hitting on those intersections. Once I get it in place, I'm going to draw all the way across. Straight. When you, and you may need a longer ruler to do this, but you do want to find something that has that 45 degree line. The reason I said I may need a longer ruler is because I need to be able to get all the way across. If you can't get all the way across, draw part of the way and then move your ruler you're going to align your 45 degree line again on the next seam so that they are together. So see, this line kind of is very pale right there. Let me darken it so you can see. I'm after, my ruler wiggled. I'm after that um, angle. I'll get it right here in a minute. Okay, so there's my double line. Let me do it again on this one. I'm looking for this intersection, this intersection that you can probably barely see because of my thread, but I'll darken it so you can see what I'm aiming for. There's that intersection and this intersection. So I'm going across, and this will be um, even more clear on the technique sheet. I'm lining up here on this intersection, here on this intersection, and on the seam on the 45 degree line. Once I get, um, if I can't get all the way across, I'll need to move my ruler and I would line back up on a, a seam. Otherwise you could end up being really pretty wonky. So there's my intersection, there's my intersection. Line up on the 45 degree line and it tells you what your angle is right there. And I'm lined up on that intersection going to go across. It may or may not land on the corner here. That's okay because that's not the important part. I'll show you here in just a second what your actual um, important parts are that you need to look for. This intersection and this intersection at a 45 degree from these seams. So that's what you're looking for when you get ready to, to mark your double line. So we're going to go back to the sewing area so you go, you're going to see what I do next with it. Any questions? Anybody? No. I don't see any other questions. Glad they can hear. Glad they can hear. <laughs> I'm glad you can hear too because this might be one that would be a little uh, difficult <laughs> just from seeing it. Yes, so here's my wonky nine patch. Now I have two different colors of rectangles. I have a background one and a red one, and that's what I need for this project. And I'm going to align my wonky nine patch on top of that big rectangle. If you feel the need to pin, you could. If you're going to pin, I would pin on the ends like this and like this. Because you're going to stitch on those intersections or on those lines and you want to hit that intersection here. So we're just going to take off and stitch. Oh my fabric tags scooting around. Now I am going to remove that pin because by the time I get to here it's in my way. You could slow down and stitch over it carefully. But as a general rule, I wouldn't have pinned it anyway. I just did it so you can see that it is possible to use a pin if you want. So I'm just lining up. This is going to get trimmed anyway, so I'm not being real fussy with it. I just line up that big rectangle on 
my um, wonky nine patch. Oops, I went the wrong way. Line this up and I've got my two rectangles, my piece rectangle and my aligned. And this is kind of like magic. When you get these stitched, there are many times when I've taught classes with the shaded four patch and the shaded nine patch, people are amazed at what it turns out to be when you flip it over and see the um, unit after you get this stitching done. I've lost my scissors somewhere there behind me, I think. I'll, oh, I know what I did with them. I took them over there to show you how to clip the seam right there. And so I used my seam marker, Tony, Tony to the rescue. And we're going to stitch right across that intersection. The easier they'll get. I'm just gonna snip this while I'm here to make it a little easier to not have to fight it. And I'm aiming for that intersection right there. Let me get a little closer so you can see. I marked it with my uh, pen, but you'll be able to see that intersection just from your thread where you stitched across. And then there's my next intersection. I'm headed for that. And we're gonna snip that. There's all sorts of really interesting units you can make and blocks you can make with the shaded nine patch. Um, there's a gallery on uh, the website, Deb's website, that shows different things that are made with the shaded nine patch. So I want to show you what happens. Once you do that double row of stitching, check it out. You get a shaded nine patch. Two that have the background as that big triangle and two that have the red as the big triangle. So now we're going to press them. Um, oh, well, first we're going to cut them apart. So you have to make a decision at this point. You have to decide if you want to have an exact quarter inch seam allowance here. If you do, you can put your ruler quarter inch line on your seam or uh, yes, on that seam that you sewed across and make that cut. Then you're going to turn this one around and put the quarter inch line on the seam so that you end up with an exact quarter inch seam allowance. Most of the time, I don't feel that necessary. So here's what I'm more likely to do. Just split the difference and cut between the two lines of stitching. Once you do that, your seam allowances are a little wider than you might normally use, but it won't really matter in the grand scheme of things. So on your shaded nine patch um, sheet, it instructs you at this point to press toward the larger plain triangle. So I am going to do that with my red fabric. And I'm just giving it a quick little finger press down that seam so I can get that seam aiming the way I want it to before I set the iron on it. And I'm going to do that with this one. And notice I'm stacking them. I do that a lot. And just giving it a finger press. And look what happens right where those intersections where I um, drew them on with a pin so you could see where I was headed. That's what it gives you, that nice, perfect, point. So once you get your seam aiming the direction you want it, if you're using acorn pressing pin, now's the time to add the solution. And while you're letting this one set, you can add solution to the other one. And then I often just stack them so that they get a little bit of extra time. So because of the way this block gets pieced together, Instead of pressing this one toward the bigger triangle, I'm going to press it toward this pieced triangle. So it's a little bit more of a challenge because I've got some bulk in that seam allowance, but if you take the time to finger press it, now you don't want to just rip your fingernail across that whole seam. You want to just do little short strokes just to flatten it. 
And once you do that, then you can take your iron and set the iron on it. And if you're going to use the acorn pressing solution, put a little solution on one end. Um, my iron doesn't fit all the way across that seam all at the same time anyway, so I just did half of it at a time. So let me do the next one. And the easiest way that I have found to do that is stack it. If you've got a little bit of extra um, fluff in the seam, just kind of peel it out or cut it out so that that gives you less bulk there on the intersections. But I put the part that I want to press toward on top and just flip it back, just give it a little finger press, and I take a little extra time right on those seams where the seams all come together. And that gives you what you need in order for that seam to go the way I want it to go. And that'll make more sense here in a minute why I did that. That actually is in the instructions for the parquet. I didn't ever tell you the name of this block. This is number 30, parquet. By the way, number 29 used um, the Rapid Fire Lemoyne Star tool, so that's why we skipped it. Um, it's a good block. If you own the Rapid Fire Lemoyne Star, you might want to try it sometime, but we're skipping those for right now. So I have four shaded nine patch blocks, and I'm going to trim these using my Tucker trimmer. It's up under here. So if you are right-handed, you're going to put the half circle up on the top right corner of your block. And I'm looking for the six and a half inch line because this block needs to finish at six inches. So the six and a half inch line is going to go on my long diagonal seam. And then this seam is going to line up right on that intersection between my corner square and my center triangle. And I just tweak it till it's straight. I want this line to be lined up on six and a half. I want this line to hit that intersection once I get that in place, then I can trim up and across. Now I'm going to turn 180 degrees. And again, I'm going to line up the six and a half on my seam. Again, I want to make sure that this long diagonal line hits that intersection between my center triangle and my corner square. And once I get that done, I can trim the other two sides. So there is my first shaded nine patch unit. So I'm going to do the same thing with one of the ones that have the red corner. If you happen to be left-handed, simply turn that half circle to the top left corner of your square and cut that way. But I'm going to line up the six and a half inch line on my center seam, line up the long common diagonal across that intersection where the uh, center triangle and the corner square meet, and I can trim up and across, and now I'm going to twist 180 degrees. So I could actually stop there, and I'll show you kind of what the block would look like. I'm not going to take the time to trim the other two, but I would need to to complete the block. But look what you could do with that. Let me get rid of this for a second. If you put these two units on opposite side and these two units on opposite sides, you'd have a really attractive block just like that. You could also flip it around and change the orientation of your units and create a different look. Now that creates a bigger square in the center and it puts a light background out here on the outside edge, which you may or may not want. You could also twist it like a pinwheel. And notice what it does. It creates that secondary little pinwheel, a uh, little pinwheel of that center triangle. And it even puts those um, corner squares in a new position. So you have lots of options. However, for this particular block, we are going to pop off the corners. And I'll show you how we do that. On your paperwork, it will tell you what size 
um, line to use. We're using the number three line. And I'm going to use the area of my um, corner pop tool that says cut away corners. And I find the number three line, line that up. And what I'm doing is trimming away the part that I don't need. And that part is waste. You can save it if you want. I'm just gonna move it out of my way for right now. You only do this step after you trim this to the six and a half inches that you need. If you try this before you trim it, it's not gonna fit right. So you're gonna trim off that excess, the extra piece that I don't need first. And then we're going to go to the sewing area so you can see what I do next. So when I get ready to put that together, I'm going to need opposite colors of squares. So I had a background triangle that I've lopped off, popped off the corner, and I need the opposite color of square that's going to overfill that corner. And what I'm going to do is, is just cut it in half, a ruler that I can cut it in half with. This one's not quite long enough. I had one here a second ago. There. So I'm going to cut corner to corner with this square. And your instructions, your cutting instructions, tell you what size those squares need to be. I'm going to go ahead and do the background square as well. And it is this information, the sizing information for this came from the instructions that come with your corner pop tool. It's on the chart right here on the corner pop tool. And it, we're using the three inch finish size so it told us we needed four and a fourth inch um, replacement triangles and the corner trim down line is the number three. So that's how I knew what size to use. There's also information on the um, Blockbuster pattern sheets too that you download. So I have my um, shaded nine patch and the opposite color triangle to fit with it. I'm going to put that triangle on bottom because it is oversized. It's going to get trimmed again. But this part where I have popped off the corner of my background uh, triangle, it will not get trimmed again. It is too size. So I want to put it on top so I can follow it and make sure it's lined up along the edge of that oversized triangle. And I take a, a big long time to explain, I want to make sure that when I place that here, I even that up and I want about the same amount of uh, triangle, my replacement triangle sticking out on both ends so that I know that it overfills my triangle space. I'm just going to line that up and stitch right across on that where I popped off that corner. And once I get that done, I am ready to press and trim. So you can actually press several different directions on these corner pop areas. That's the nice thing about making this, what we used to call folded corners with this technique, because I can press toward this triangle, I can press toward this wedge, I can actually even press this seam open. But I'm going to choose to press toward my darker fabric in this case, and I'm going to give it just a little finger press. Just line up on that seam and give that a little press. And then we're going to get the acorn pressing pin, give it a little solution. While we're doing that, I'm actually going to press this one toward the triangle. Again, I happen to be pressing toward the darker fabric. So I'm pressing toward the triangle. I'll turn it over here in just a minute so you can see how that worked out. I don't remember if I used the acorn pressing pin or not, so I'll just use it again. If I didn't, now I did. If I did, it won't hurt anything. So once I do that, notice I pressed this one toward the wedge of red. I pressed this one toward the triangle of red. That's going to help later. So now all I have to do is turn my corner pop tool around and find the number three line 
that line is going on that seam and I want to even it up so that the edges here line up with that dashed line so that I know that's actually a six and a half inch square because I'm trimming off the edges of that oversized triangle. I shouldn't actually cut anything off of this part. Sometimes I get, you know, a thread just to clean it up. But once I get that done, I'm actually finished with that unit. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm finding the number three, uh, number three line. That also puts the number six line down the center, which is helpful. That's another way you check and make sure that you're straight and square. And notice I ended up not actually trimming anything off of these wedges, which means that it was placed appropriately. Now, the reason I pressed the way I did is because these two pieces get stitched together. And because I pressed away from this wedge and toward this wedge, they'll nest right here, up there. And because I pressed toward this triangle and away from this triangle, they'll nest right there. So I'll put this here and let me grab these other two. I'm not going to take the time to make the other ones, but notice, wrong color, hang on. Even though it has the really pale blue, you can see how that block would go together. You can also probably see why I decided to switch to the darker blue, because in this case, it's not just a matter of what you're seeing on screen. And live and in person, this is just too pale for where I wanted it to be. So sometimes you find things like that as you're piecing, um, and sometimes you make decisions about fabric that when you get them together, they just don't look like what you expected. Right. And that's, Tony says, that's why it's good to make one block to try things out. I have to admit, I don't often do that, but... Um, that's why it's a good idea to do that because you can see these places where it's just not strong enough uh, to suit the design. So I like the darker blue better. So I'll finish those sections and I'll sew it together. So just so you can see how easily these places where I pressed so that they nest, I'm going to show, show you how easily they stitch together. So I'm going back to the needle. So you can see, so here's my needle, and I'm stitching the, those center triangles where I've popped off the corner, and I nest right here, and I am going to pin that because I want that to stay put while I get this one ready, and they nest here, and I'm going to pin that. And just to make it easier on myself, I'm actually going to pin out here. I don't always pin, but if I'm going to take the time to pin, I'm going to pin in such a way that it's actually, actually going to help me. So I'm going to start at this side of this unit, and I'm going to stitch off of my fabric tag onto that section, and I'm going to take that pin out as I get there. And I'll show you, if you decide to sew over pins, just slow down. You can actually carefully sew over a pin. And that gives you time to adjust the edges of your fabric if they're kind of separating. Sometimes they do. But you do want to slow down if you're coming up to a pin. If you go flying over it, somehow that just ensures you're going to hit it. So let me show you what happened because of the way it was pressed. So here is my center section, and see how nicely those seams match up? This is the center of my block, and this would be on the outside edge. And of course, you don't have to arrange yours this way. You can arrange your block however you want to, but I would encourage you to press the way I showed you so that they nest at this point. Okay, so... It is possible to sign up and pay for your class online um, if you want to take one of the classes, whether you want to do Zoom or in person, you can do either one. And um, if you have questions about it, give me a call. I generally send uh, supply information about a week before the class um, because we have to have a minimum, minimum number, too. That also plays into it. So until uh, next time, happy sewing. Come see us. And we'll see you next week live at 5.